welcome to Elements of Ayurveda, Empowering Wisdom of Life. I'm your host, Colette, and in this podcast, I hope to empower you to take charge of your own health by sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. We will also discuss topics like health and wellness, nutrition, yoga, fitness, meditation, breath work, and much more, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to Mother Nature, and to each other. If you like the content, be sure to subscribe to the show, and the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend you listen to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. I've also set up a Facebook group for us to connect and to support each other. And I'd love for you to join me over at Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. And now here's the show. Hey there, it's Colette. And today I'm going to talk about two very special foods that are all about love. And why am I focusing on love today? Because this episode will air and go live on St. Valentine's Day. So how could I not? So while I don't normally get caught up with the whole commercialization of Valentine's Day, I do want to talk about these foods that symbolize love. And the first one, of course, is chocolate, known for being an aphrodisiac. But the second one may surprise you is coconut oil. And I say that you might be a bit surprised because what is the symbolism between coconut oil and love? Well, In Sanskrit, the word for oil is sneha, and sneha is also the word for love. So there you go. That's the association. So I'm going to start off talking about chocolate, and then we'll go into talking about coconut oil, and I have a nice little challenge at the end for you, so stay tuned, please. Now, chocolate has been deemed a treat food or maybe a bad food. But however, that's mostly due to the ingredients we add to it, like the extra sugar and fat, which makes up all the calories. But in fact, chocolate is considered a superfood. Now, chocolate goes back eons. It goes back to the ancient Mayans and even earlier to the ancient Olmecs of southern Mexico. And that dates back to around 1500 B.C., Now, chocolate is made from the fruits of the cacao trees. These fruits are called pods, and each pod contains about 40 cacao beans. So the cacao beans are harvested, and then there's two very different paths that this bean can take. So I'm going to start off with the purest path, which is raw cacao. And raw cacao is made by cold pressing on roasted cacao beans. The process keeps the living enzymes in the cacao and removes the fat, the cacao butter. Cocoa looks the same, but it's actually not. Cocoa powder is raw cacao that has been roasted at high temperatures. And sadly, the roasting changes the molecular structure of the cacao bean, reducing the enzyme content and lowering the overall nutritional value. Therefore, cacao powder is known to have higher antioxidant content than cocoa. And cacao is the purest form of chocolate you can consume, which means it is raw and much less processed than cocoa powder or chocolate bars. Now, while raw cacao bars and powder are the best for you and the highest nutritional value, all is not lost. Because we're now going to talk about the other path that these raw cacao beans can take into producing the chocolate bars that we have. And there's still benefits in this these chocolate bars. But just I want you to just know that the raw cacao is the purest form of chocolate and it will have the higher antioxidant content. So the other path these cacao beans can take is that they are dried and roasted and ground into a paste called cocoa liquor or cocoa solids. The solids are then separated into cocoa butter and powder. Now these ingredients are used in varying amounts to make different types of chocolate that we know and love, right? You have your dark chocolate and milk chocolate, which both have cocoa solids and cocoa butter. But milk chocolate has fewer solids and more sugar and milk is added. 
And then white chocolate doesn't contain any cocoa solids. So it's important to note that the cocoa solids are the only source of flavonoids, which are a plant-based antioxidant. So now we know that the best chocolate is the raw chocolate and raw powder, cacao chocolate and cacao powder. The next best is the dark chocolate because it has this, these flavonoids. And since flavonoids are only found in the cocoa solids, you can use the percentage of cocoa solids on the chocolate label as a general guide for choosing chocolate with the most flavonoids. So unsweetened cocoa powder has about 88 to 96% cocoa solids. Dark chocolate contains 45 to 80 percent cocoa solids and milk chocolate has about five to seven percent. So again, the dark chocolate is better. The type of flavonoids found in chocolate are called flavanols and studies have shown that eating one to two ounces of dark chocolate daily, that's dark chocolate with a 70 percent or higher cocoa content, which contains these flavanols, may lower your blood pressure and cholesterol, may improve your glucose metabolism and maintain the health of your blood vessels, improving vascular function and reducing the risk of stroke. So you can see dark chocolate still has lots of benefits. So the dark chocolate with the 70% or higher cocoa content is high in antioxidants, which are the substances that reduce the ongoing cellular and arterial damage caused by oxidative reactions. Therefore, chocolate essentially is anti-aging. Another type of antioxidant called polyphenols, which you've probably heard of before, these are the protective chemicals found in plant foods such as red wine and green tea. But chocolate is particularly rich in polyphenols and these really help to protect against heart disease. Now, chocolate, as we've seen here, has many benefits for the body, but also has huge benefits for the mind. Chocolate can affect the brain by causing the release of certain neurotransmitters. Now, neurotransmitters are the molecules that transmit signals between neurons. The amounts of particular neurotransmitters we have at any given time can greatly impact our mood. So eating chocolate increases the levels of endorphins released into the brain, which is why chocolate is considered a comfort food. And these endorphins work to lessen pain and decrease stress. Sounds good, right? Another chemical found in chocolate is called theobromine, and this can affect the nervous system. It has properties that can lead to mental and physical relaxation, and it also acts as a stimulant similar to caffeine. Now, scientists debate whether caffeine is present in chocolate. Some scientists believe that it's the less potent theobromine, which is solely responsible for the caffeine-like effect. So it gives you that stimulant, but it's not at that wired effect that caffeine has. Now, chocolate also contains phenethylamine, which triggers the release of pleasurable endorphins. So this so-called chocolate amphetamine causes changes in the blood pressure and blood sugar levels, leading to feelings of excitement and alertness. It works like amphetamines to increase mood and decrease depression, but it does not result in the same tolerance or addiction. So phenylethylamine is also called the love drug because it causes your pulse rate to quicken, resulting in a similar feeling to when somebody is in love. Now, another special chemical found in chocolate is called anandamide. And it's also a fatty substance that is naturally produced in our brain. Anandamide, which is derived from the Sanskrit word ananda, which means bliss, is a cannabinoid, a member of the same psychoactive substances found in cannabis. It activates the receptor which causes the production of dopamine, a neurotransmitter, which leads to feelings of well-being and bliss. So anandamide is found naturally in our brains, like I said, However, it breaks down very rapidly. So this anandamide in chocolate helps to slow down the breakdown of this anandamide, thus extending the feelings of well-being. 
Anandamide produces a global feeling of euphoria. This compound may account for why some people become euphoric or blissed out when they eat chocolate. So are you wanting a chocolate bar now? So let me talk about serotonin levels because chocolate also boosts serotonin levels. Low serotonin has been linked to depression. Serotonin is an important chemical and a neurotransmitter in the body, and it is believed to help regulate the mood and social behavior, appetite and digestion, sleep, memory and sexual desire and function. Serotonin is typically lower in women during PMS and menstruation, which really explains why we crave chocolate during this time of our cycle, right? So it all makes sense. Now let's talk a little bit about Ayurveda and chocolate. Well, chocolate, and here I'm going to talk about the qualities of raw cacao. So it's considered bitter and has a pungent aftertaste. Other attributes are light and dry and hot. It has a heating energy and it can also be a stimulant, which we just talked about, and it can also be considered hard to digest. Now, for that reason, pitta is aggravated by the hot, pungent qualities. It can cause headaches and migraines, perhaps heartburn or eye and skin irritations, all signs of a pitta imbalance. Or, However, if your pitta is balanced and you want to have some chocolate, well, I would suggest choosing chocolate with some cooling qualities to balance out that heat, that pungent heating quality. And you could choose chocolate with something like mint in it or coconut, which we know is cooling, or a rose. So there are some ideas that if you're pitta constitution, you're feeling imbalanced, you don't have any any signs of heating imbalances, well then you could enjoy chocolate in moderation and maybe using having ingredients in that chocolate bar that are cooling like mint, rose or coconut. Now vata is too aggravated by the dry and pungent and bitter taste and the stimulating quality also can be very activating for the vata nervous system. Plus, it's hard to digest. So for the irregular vata agni or digestive fire, it may be too much. But again, I have a solution for those of you who have a high vata constitution, but are not showing any signs of vata imbalance. Well, then perhaps you could enjoy a little bit of dark chocolate, like a hot chocolate using the raw cacao powder with some ghee or coconut oil in your hot chocolate would really be great to balance out that, that stimulating effect of chocolate. Or you could have chocolate that has some digestive aids in it. And this could be something like with the ginger. You've seen dark chocolate with ginger now. That would be a good option for you. Now, kapha will benefit from the chocolate qualities of pungent, light, dry, and hot qualities. However, we have to remember kapha has a sluggish digestion and the raw cacao can be hard to digest and can be heavy depending on the quality of the chocolate. So again, if you are kapha dosha, and you're feeling imbalanced and you want a little bit of chocolate, maybe choosing chocolate with some ingredients that are known to aid digestion that could be with some chili in it or some ginger like I mentioned for vata or maybe some pepper again there's lots and lots of varieties out there so begin interesting to do a little test and see how that chocolate uh, reacts for for your dosha so obviously the type of chocolate is key here and particularly for kapha if there's lots of fats or sweeteners added to the chocolate can really aggravate the kapha. So for kapha, you really want to make sure you're choosing high quality, either a raw cacao, or you could choose the dark chocolate with a high cocoa content. Now a medicinal dose 
of chocolate is generally a maximum of two squares daily of dark chocolate. Again, the 70% plus cocoa content, that's organic and fair trade. And it's important to remember that fair trade is something you should look out for when you're choosing chocolate, because unfortunately, there's a lot of child labor used in the harvesting of cocoa beans. So making sure that you're choosing high quality chocolate and that it is fair trade and know that you'll be doing a lot for those farmers who are making great efforts to harvest the cacao bean fairly. Now, another thing that you might have heard of are cacao ceremonies. And I know I took part in some of those when I was living in California. And they have become very popular. But these cacao ceremonies date back to the ancient Aztec and Mayan civilizations. And one of the main reasons for using cacao in a ceremony or as a medicine, is for emotional healing. Because we can see the benefits I just lifted, listed out, not only for the body, but for the mind. You can see why it would be such a great emotional healer. So when used with intention of healing and opening the heart, cacao has tremendous potential for doing some very profound work. The cacao used in ceremony is usually dark and rich, and it's a bitter brew, which you drink, and it may be infused with herbs or spices. Now, why does cacao have such emotional healing properties? Well, it's naturally very high in magnesium. And magnesium is known as a relaxer, relaxing the muscles and softening the tissues. So when we drink strong cacao brew, like in a cacao ceremony, it relaxes the heart muscles and in turn opens up the heart chakra. So by relaxing the heart, both physically and energetically, this can allow our hearts to open and emotions to flow. So let me know over on the elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group, if you have taken part in cacao ceremonies or if you offer them, I know many studios offer them now, yoga studios offer them now. So it'd be great to hear. I know I really enjoyed them when I took part in them and it's a beautiful ceremony to, to witness. So that's all about chocolate today. I know when I was doing the research for this episode, it helped clear up a lot of things for me. And again, I'm going to have a nice little challenge, a chocolate challenge at the end of the show. So stay tuned for that. Now, before I go on to discuss coconut oil, I want to tell you about my new Patreon page. Patreon is a platform for creators, and it's a way for people to donate to content which creators are creating for free. I have many people ask me how they can support me as I'm providing lots of valuable free information through this podcast. And normally I would say, you know what, it'd be great if you could just leave a review on iTunes. That would be fantastic. More people will find the show and we can get Ayurveda out there even more. However, I've learned about Patreon in the past year and I've hesitated because it's really hard for me to ask for support. But I've realized that I'm putting a lot of work into this podcast for free. And, you know, it takes a lot of research and time to record and edit and upload and so on. And so if people want to support me and appreciate what I'm doing, then I need to and would be happy to accept their support. So if you're interested and you would like to be a patron of the Elements of Ayurveda podcast then you can do so by visiting my page. I'll put the link in the show notes, but the page is called Patreon, that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com forward slash Elements Community. That's patreon.com forward slash Elements Community. And like I said, I'll put a link in the show notes also. Now, there are a couple of ways that you can donate if you wish. You can just leave a tip of the amount of your choice, or you can join the monthly Patreon club where I'll be offering lots of extras. So go there to the page, check out the options if you're interested. And thank you in advance if you're interested in supporting the podcast. So there you go. Phew, that was a big deal for me. I really had to put on my big girl pants uh, to announce this today. I have put this off for months. So 
uh, yeah, check it out. And like I said, if you're interested in supporting, great. If not, keep enjoying the show. And I love to produce it. So thank you just for listening. Okay, there you go. So now let's move on to coconut oil. So coconut oil is known as one of the healthiest oils on earth. Now, thankfully, we're now over our harmful, no fat, low fat craze of the 80s and early 90s. And fats like coconut oil have been given their place back on the good food list. Now, coconut oil comes from coconuts, obviously, and they take about 12 months to mature. Now, some say that the best yields from the nuts are the ones that fall to the ground naturally when they fully mature. So it's these coconuts, these fully mature coconuts that make the best tasting coconut oil with the highest amounts of lauric acid, which is really important, which is what sets coconut oil apart. I'm going to talk more about in a minute. Now, well, first of all, I want to talk about the different stages of maturity of coconuts because this is really important. And Ayurveda, the classical texts, divide coconuts into three types. So this is great to know if you're choosing a coconut, you know, coconut water versus a middle-aged coconut versus a mature coconut. So the first one is a young coconut, which is up to 95% water, and it is the purest and has the most healing properties. It's known for its cooling qualities, which is why we recommend it for cooling the pitta heat. Now, this coconut also lubricates the body, repairs the gastrointestinal tract, and has a rejuvenating property to strengthen the muscle, the cardiovascular system, and the seven tissues of the body. So young coconuts are known also for unclogging the srotas or the body's channels. And in fact, a study of the inhabitants of the South Pacific Islands was done at one time. And they have a diet that's really high in coconut. And their cardiovascular systems were found to be in excellent condition. And they did not suffer from any clogged arteries, which is what we were led to believe, right? Back in, like I said, in the 80s and early 90s, we thought that all fat was bad. But in fact, we can see now that it's particularly this young coconut has a clearing effect on the channels of the body. So going against that, that belief from a couple of decades ago that it would clog up and, and cause problems for the heart. Now, the second classification for coconuts is the middle-aged coconut. And the middle-aged coconut has some soft coconut meat and some milky water, but obviously less than the young coconut. This coconut has healing properties and is cleansing to the urinary tract and is said to be the most nutritious in the classical text. It has the most carbohydrates, proteins, minerals, phosphorus, and also vitamins A, B, and C. So it has more nutrition than the other two than the young or the mature coconut. Now, the final one, the mature coconut, has more firm meat and very little water. This meat is heavier to digest and can aggravate pitta and vata if the vata digestion is low, low if the digestive fire is low or it's irregular. Consuming mature coconut on a regular basis can cause hyperacidity, which is why it can be aggravating to pitta, and it can elevate cholesterol levels along with interfering with digestion because of that heaviness. So if you have a low digestive fire, it's best to avoid the mature coconut. And in India, this type of coconut is often grated and combined with heating ingredients to offset the heaviness, like ginger, like mustard seeds or curry leaves. And it's made into the chutney. So mature coconuts increase the quantity and quality of the seven tissues. So they are vata pacifying in nature because of their unctuous qualities. And they cool and strengthen and are filled with sweetness. So it's interesting looking at these three classifications that if you're looking for some cooling benefits and healing benefits, then the coconut, the young coconut is the best to go for and the coconut water from a young coconut. And then the middle aged coconut has the most nutritional value while the mature one is a little heavier. So oftentimes you may see in this, in the store that they'll sell the mature coconut just 
coconut chunks. So just know that, you know, if you think you're eating that and it's going to be good, it may be a little heavy for the digestion. And particularly for kapha and for pitta, it's um, hyper acidity can cause increased pitta. And then for vata, if a vata has a irregular digestion or a lot of digestive upset, then it can be too heavy to digest. On the other hand, if vata is feeling good and balanced, then it does have some great strengthening qualities because, again, it strengthens and increases the quality and quantity of all seven tissues. So if a vata person is feeling a little underweight or uh, low weight, well, this will be a good food for you. So coconut oil comes from the flesh of the coconut, which is also known as the kernel. And the type of coconut oil you buy is really important. And you know now that there's many on the market and it can be hard to choose from. So let me kind of clear this up a little bit. You want to buy a high quality, cold pressed, extra virgin, non-GMO, unrefined organic coconut oil. Did you get that? Cold pressed extra virgin, non-GMO, unrefined, that's a big one, organic coconut oil. So avoiding any refined coconut oil, because this oil is extracted from previously dried coconut meat. And it this meat could have been sitting there for months and maybe moldy or just maybe sitting around for a long time. So they extract the coconut meat from these the dried coconut with chemical solvents or through physical extraction methods. And in this method, some of the beneficial nutrients are lost. And you also want to avoid deodorized coconut oil for the same reason because it's refined. On the other hand, virgin and extra virgin coconut oils are the same thing describing unrefined coconut oil. So you don't have to be too concerned whether it's virgin or extra virgin. It just means it's really unrefined. Now, cold pressed is important because cold pressed oils are extracted by boiling, fermenting, refrigerating, and centrifugation. So since high temperatures and chemicals are not used in this process, cold pressed oils retain all the phytochemicals, which are the chemicals, the naturally chemicals derived from plants, the good ones, along with the distinctive taste and smell of coconut. This is the purest form of coconut oil, which is white in color. Now, cold pressed is not an official classification, but simply suggests that the oil has been subjected to less intense refining, lower temperature and no chemicals. So that's the best one to purchase. It also may be a little bit more expensive, but as you can see, you get what you pay for and it will be worth it. So avoiding the refined and the deodorized. Coconut oil contains a lot of medium chain fatty acids, which is why it's so special. One of the reasons it's so special, which assists in maintaining liver health and minimizing free radical formation. Now, free radicals are when an oxygen molecule splits into single atoms with unpaired electrons. But electrons like to be in pairs. So these atoms called free radicals scavenge the body to seek out other electrons so that they can become a pair. Now this causes damage to the cells, proteins, and DNA. So coconut oil minimizes this free radical formation and really maintains the liver health. Now, because of its high saturated fat content, coconut oil was once, as I said earlier, thought to be unhealthy. However, researchers studying its unique properties have discovered an important difference between coconut oil and other high saturated fat foods. What sets coconut oil apart from other oils is the fact that it contains a high concentration of lauric acid, which is also found in breast milk and is responsible for building a baby's immune system. Now, lauric acid, the predominant medium chain fatty acid found in coconut oil, has proven antibacterial, antimicrobial, antifungal, antiviral, and anti-inflammatory properties. And so it destroys all harmful viruses and bacteria and therefore improves our immune system as adults. 
So this lauric acid is really a special quality in coconut oil that really sets it apart from other oils. Now, from a Western perspective, coconut is alkaline food and is high in saturated fat and fiber and also contains protein and important minerals like calcium, iron, potassium, and magnesium. And from an Ayurvedic perspective, coconut oil is considered sweet and cooling, and it can have the quality of heaviness. So the actions on the dosha would be that it balances vata and pitta, but it increases kapha in excess. So Ayurveda understood the healing power of coconuts, and so now do modern scientists and researchers, as there have been numerous scientific research and peer-reviewed studies presenting evidence to demonstrate the amazing powers of coconut oil in improving virtually every area of your health and your quality of life. So here are just a few studies. A study published in 2010 in Skin Pharmacology and Physiology determined that the oil had a beneficial effect on treating wounds. And another study in 2012 in the Evidence-Based Complementary and Alternative Medicine Journal discovered that the coconut oil helped prevent bone loss due to osteoporosis and improved bone structure. In 2004, the Neurobiology of Aging published a study showing that medium-chain fatty acids improved memory recall in, in Alzheimer's patients. And in 2003, a study published in the Journal of Cosmetic Sciences found that coconut oil used for hair conditioned and improved damaged hair and protected hair from further damage. Also, in the Journal of Medicinal Food in June 2007, they advised that coconut oil should be used as a treatment of fungal infections. So many studies there, but other health benefits include the fact that coconut oil increases the body's absorption of necessary vitamins and minerals by as much as 18 times. And this is when you add it to foods or when you consume it prior to food. It can really help with the absorption of these great vitamins and minerals. And it also improves mental alertness. So 60% of our brain is fat. Therefore, we need to feed it some healthy fat to make it function better because, of course, it can dry out as we get older. So with medium chain fatty acids that are quickly and easily digested, coconut oil has special stimulating effects on brain functioning that no other saturated fat provides. So ingesting it benefits your brain by providing immediate and long-lasting energy. Now, I mentioned lauric acid earlier as it's antibacterial, antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal, and combatant against infection. And these powerful properties of coconut oil can effectively relieve fungal infections by ingesting it or even just applying it topically. So I could go on and on about the benefits of coconut oil. I'm sure you've already heard numerous benefits yourself. But also I want to talk about today is simple ways that you could use it. For a simple way is to take it straight on a spoon from the jar. Now, of course, this the amount would vary from person to person, depending on your dosha and depending on your imbalance. And this is you know, tailored information I would give in an Ayurvedic consult. But for vata, we can see that it's very healing for vata. So using coconut oil in your food is would be great. So too for pitta because it's got those cooling properties. But for kapha, you'd have to be careful about how much of the saturated fat you would use. So I don't really want to give amounts here because as you know, in Ayurveda, it, there's no one size fits all. But uh, in a consultation, I'd certainly talk to you about that. You could also cook with it, of course. And the wonderful thing about coconut oil is that it has a high burn point, a high smoke point. So it's really great to cook with and adds a great flavor to food. Uh, You could also add it to your coffee or your turmeric golden milk. And this is a really great tip for a vata constitution who likes coffee, but you get that wired feeling afterwards. Well, adding some coconut oil to your caffeine is a great way to stabilize that energy. 
You could also use it in baking, like coconut butter. And of course, as a oil massage for the Abhyanga oil massage that we talk about in Ayurveda, coconut oil is great. Remember, coconut oil is cooling. So it's best to use when the temperatures are high in the environment and really best for the pitta dosha. For the kapha and vata who tend to have cold constitution, it's not the best oil to put on your body. Of course, we talked about earlier, it can be used as a hair conditioner. It really improves the quality of the hair. A tip that I have when you're using coconut oil in your hair and giving yourself a scalp massage with it is when you get into the shower, put your shampoo on first so it can pull out the oil because if you wet the hair first, it's harder to get the oil out. So I discovered. (laughs) So that's one of my tips. It can also be used as a makeup remover. It's really great to remove your makeup, your eye makeup in particular. And it's really great for oil pulling, of course. So oil pulling is, if you don't already know, the ancient Ayurvedic practice, which is very common today. And some people will recommend sesame oil. I tend to recommend coconut oil. But it's really great for oral health because of its antimicrobial properties and it deters bad bacteria and plaque while supporting healthy gum tissue. And this is what's really important because that acts as a barrier against bacteria exposure to the bloodstream. So now that is the end of all my spiel on coconut oil. But here's where I have a nice challenge for you. At least I think it's nice. Now I'm not a baker, but I've decided that after doing all this research and chocolate and coconut oil and coming across so many gorgeous recipes for raw chocolate, and it brings me back to my memories of when I spent the time in Bali And I used to have their raw chocolate. They had amazing raw chocolate in Bali and particularly in Ubud. And they used to combine it with like peppermint and goji berries. It was so good. And I haven't found anything like it since. So I'm going to try my own because after doing all this research, I'm dying for some raw chocolate now. So if you would like to join me, I'm going to put the recipe up on the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group. But basically, the recipe calls for coconut oil, one cup of coconut oil, one cup of unsweetened cacao powder, uh, some honey or liquid stevia or coconut nectar to taste, a teaspoon of vanilla extract. I might use peppermint there. And then you can have toppings that we talked about earlier. Like you could have ginger if you're vata or kapha. You could have um, mint or coconut if you're a high pitta constitution. So I'll put that recipe up there and please come join me. I'm excited to try it out and I will post the results on the Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. That's really putting me under pressure because like I said, I'm not a baker, but I figure I can handle this one. It's pretty easy. So I'd love to see your results or your thoughts on what I discussed today on the raw chocolate or coconut oil. And if you have any questions, you can post them also in the Elements of Ayurveda podcast Facebook group. So I hope you try it out, this recipe, and I'm really looking forward to seeing and hearing about your results. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you found this episode interesting and I hope you feel the love from the chocolate and the coconut oil and just know that they're doing great things for your body so you can enjoy them in moderation. Also, just to want to remind you about the Patreon page. You can check out the link in the show notes. It's patreon.com forward slash elements community. And again, I appreciate you and thank you for your support. Until next time, be well, take good care of yourself and enjoy your chocolate and coconut oil. Ciao for now.